Let's start. There we go. <laughs> All right, now we're going to get rid of some stuff here. <laughs> Go. Yeah. All right. Uh, we are you the uh, sheets here? And uh, would it, uh, somebody want to read this? Confidence. Oh, God, thou art very great. My lot is to approach thee with godly fear and humble confidence, for thy condescension equals my thy grandeur, and thy goodness is thy glory. I am unworthy. But thou dost welcome guilty, but thou art merciful, in, in, indigent, but thy uh, riches are unsearchable. Thou hast shown boundless compassion towards me by not sparing thy son, and by giving me freely all things in him. This is the foundation of my hope, the refuge of my safety, the new and living way to be, the means of that conviction of sin, brokenness, and heart and self-despair, which will endear me to me, the gospel. Happy are they who are Christ, in him at peace with thee, justified from all things, delivered from coming wrath, made heirs of future glory, give me such deadness to the world, such love to the Savior, such attachment to his house, to his house such devotedness to his service, as proves me a subject of his salvation. May every part of my character and conduct make a serious and amiable impression on others and impel them, impel them to ask the way to the master. Let no incident of life, pleasing or painful, injure the prosperity of my soul, but rather increase it. Send me thy help or thine appointments are not meant to make me independent of thee, and the most means will be vain without super added blessings. I think he sums it all up when he says, This is the foundation of my hope, which is on top of that. Well, yeah. I think this was when we did last week, right? Wonders. Because I, I remember yeah. that. The justified peace, that's by delivered from wrath and made heirs. Yeah. I was saying that was that's the actually, actually, I think it is, <laughs> and it's Walt's fault. <laughs> I think I wanted us to read it twice. This yeah. night, that was good. You know, it's okay. <laughs> um, so I never brought them in. Yeah, we're sitting here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No so, worries. Um, but. Uh, and of course, yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. Things yeah. anyway. It's fine. I know, and, and you know, I didn't really. I didn't really read it last week, so I didn't get the uh, the full meaning of what it was. But boy, what's and this is a real different sort of uh, uh, feeling about it than what most of them have been, because mm -hmm. most of them are, a lot of them are sort of drear. You know, that we've read this one just is like the sunrise, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the confidence that we can have. And uh, so uh, I, I found it really good. I found, uh, how about uh, you can enlighten me from last week, too? <laughs> oh, I, I uh, circled that no incident of life. Pleasing or painful injure the prosperity of my soul, but rather increase it. And I also said, also said that we can go boldly, but not arrogantly. Right. Before right. Yes. Yeah. 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 Anything else? Something I, I can't find in there, but something about judgment. Give me such such deadness to the world. That uh, stands out too. Yeah, that's hard to do. It is. <clears throat> we, we, we still have to be alive in this world, but he's, he, yeah. we don't have to be part of it. Yeah, especially right. living in America, it's very hard yeah. Yeah. to not want more than what we really need. <laughs> now, who pushes those tables back? 
I had that table up front because I'm uh, sitting at that one. And so I had the tables way up, you know, so that there was yeah. more room for it. Yeah. I'll Somebody see. comes in and does things to this room when I'm not here. And there's maybe they have something going on in the middle of a week or so. Yeah. No, actually, we did it Wednesday. Um, I, I thought oh, I finished it Wednesday. <laughs> so I don't know. Anything. Investigation. Yes. No, I had said um, that the whole gospel, this is the only way. This is the only way I knew it was repeated because I, I had re this part came out to me. The whole gospel is in this this um this paragraph. Happy mm. are they who Christ in Him? There's peace. We're justified. We're delivered from wrath. We're made heirs to future glory. I mean, that's the entire gospel. Um, and it's neat because working at the Belkin Concord, we're with a lot of Christians, but obviously there's those that we I pray for. But God's just put this one late one gal into my life that. I, I kind of walked in on a conversation she was having with my assistant, who's middle school teacher by day, <laughs> and um, her she you know she wanted her son to be in Melissa's class, and they got to talking about the daughter, saying, "Oh, um, I'm thinking about that school too, but we're just not sure about that chapel thing. We're that's just not us. That's not who we are." Mm -hmm. And I figured, okay, Melissa's trying to get her to a Christian school. Melissa's a Christian, mm -hmm. and she's like, "Oh, but the worship is contemporary and everything like that." And I thought, I wonder why, you know, she just doesn't know or what. So I looked her up on her Facebook and it turns out her dear brother died about a year ago from suicide. And just, and I looked on his Facebook and he had this, he was in New York and had a girlfriend and, you know, had a great job at some bartender. And it even shows him, um, you know, a shot with Jamie Fox. But yeah, his life just seemed to be, and he said, I give all glory to God for, you know, all of this blessing you know to be in New York with this and that so obviously he had his name is Saul David uh and I thought well there's Christians either Jewish or Christian but they're Latina um from in Miami originally and lived in New Jersey but um so I'm thinking and for some reason God's just laid her on my heart um with all that to say that you know I don't even know really where I was going with that but that's the gospel right there in that particular and for me, I was just praying, God, just let me speak the words to her. You know, I'm watching The Chosen right now, which I, I didn't watch it for every reason. I thought another well, no, should maybe whatever, you know, episode, but it's really, really good. Learning so much by watching that. But um, yeah, I mean, we it, it, one thing that show emphasizes is the importance of just telling. And we have to tell. Yeah, you know, it's interesting coming off of our conversation at the men's group the other night about how... Uh, they read that book by that guy that uh the guy that wrote up the book that we're studying has sort of said this guy's wrong in some of the things oh, yeah. he's saying yeah, we were saying that's an example of what yeah. is is a problem with the other guys uh, vegan i think his name is yeah. his mindset is he's like oh it's okay to be crazy right. as a christian and uh uh so you know, and, and I'm, I'm going to talk to some of the guys about that and, because they're comparing the two books in the wrong way. Right. Because the book that we're reading is a biblically based one. That guy's based on experience. Mm -hmm. Which book is that? Uh, uh, we're, we're reading the, uh, for the men's group, we're reading The Masculine Mandate oh, okay. by Phillips, who's a PCA pastor. Yeah, I really have. Yeah, he's, and, and it's, it's an excellent book. Every kid, I wish I'd read it when I was like 18. You know, it would have made it, I mean, it's just such a good book. But um, uh, the other guy was a, was a motorcycle guy and mm -hmm. he was involved in the uh, motocross and his, his, he was the, the guy that was in charge of it. And, but he became a believer, but he's not given up a lot of the, the craziness in his life. And he's in this book that he wrote, some of our guys have read and they're saying, okay, well, you know, we don't have to go to church to worship God right? or to be a Christian. Slippery slope. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, I understand that, you know, guys that go hunting and they'll understand the wonder, but any hunter can do that. Any hunter can do that. A nominal Christian hunter can do that. So anyway, What's the name of that book one more time? Uh, the, the one you're studying about? Uh, it's a masculine mandate. Okay. Yeah, and it's uh it's available through Legionnaire. If you if you want to get them, um 
we can get them at a discount through Ligonier. And you just, um, we get them and then we just repay the church for it. Okay. They do it through the church. Oh, okay. Amazon. See what... They're about $14 on Amazon. We get it for about half that. Oh, okay. Through our partnership. Well, that's four boys. <laughs> I can even, um, I can bid no use money. Well, we'll we'll be getting. I we just ordered some more, yeah. so and if I can order them and get them within a couple. Perfect. Yeah. So. I, I didn't mean to get us on track there, but uh, no, it was that 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 whole thing of the yeah. gospel, and and she had been on my mind. I'm like, how do I? Present that to her without being preachy or whatever. I, I, to me, I thought maybe she's angry at God because yeah. her, I think the brother committed suicide just based on her her post in his yeah. you know that she had made throughout the year. Um, and then so I wonder if she's just mad because there's obviously strong faith yeah. uh, in that family yeah. with his name and the things he was saying and their Latino, you know. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. All right. Um, Bill's not here because he's not feeling well. Today. And Joan, of course, is working with the kids right now. So she'll be in Maryland's uh, in the kitchen this week. So they're cleaning up from that. So we won't see her today. So, and, and uh, Joan, sometimes she can't leave because uh, Gary needs her around. So, so let me pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thanks for this day. And we thank you, Lord, for all the blessings you give to us. Pray that you'll be with Bill as he. Uh, is not feeling well, but he's having some difficulties with the cold, and we pray that that's all that it is, and we pray that he'll be back uh, uh, and able to uh, be be with us. Lord, we pray that uh, you will bless our time together. We thank you for uh, R.C. and the life that he led and the teaching that he has done and how they Ligonier has made it available to us. What a blessing that is. And Lord, we pray that uh, you will uh, again, bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh -oh. This is really getting annoying. There we go. All right, we're going to be looking at the monarchy this week. And I gave you that sheet because I could not get the quotation, which is in your workbook, by the way. Um, it's in there, and I wasn't able to get it into the uh, onto one slide. Hmm. And so, uh, true to their nature as holy scriptures, the books of Samuel were written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. As a source of instruction, the writer of Hebrews used 1st and 2nd Samuel, citing David and the prophet Samuel as heroic examples of faith and action. James urged his readers to take as an example of patience in the face of suffering the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Presumably, he was in part referring to Samuel. Along with the rest of the scriptures, the New Testament writers urged Christians to keep the words of 1st and 2nd Samuel in remembrance and to implement their teachings. So, I guess I did get it on there. How about that? <laughs> All right, so here we go. One of the things that frustrates me when I see people beginning to study the <laughs> Old Testament, and as I've said before, they make such a good beginning reading through Genesis and Exodus, and then they start to lose their zeal when they get bogged down in Leviticus and Numbers and so on. And I get disappointed because I just want them to get to First and Second Samuel. I love the books of Samuel. There is so much content in these books as uh, the scriptures reveal to us the lives of some of the most important personages of the Old Testament. But it's not just the, the lives of the Old Testament saints that stand out in uh, the books of Samuel, but again we see such a magnificent portrait of God. Now, we've mentioned already the period of the judges, and I said that the 
period of the Judges extends all the way up to and including Samuel. But of course, the story of Samuel is not given until the book of 1 Samuel. And Samuel is introduced as the son of the woman Hannah who had been childless and who had prayed and prayed and prayed that God would hear her prayer and grant her a son. And in fact, the prayer of Hannah that is found early on in 1 Samuel is almost exactly duplicated later on in the New Testament in the prayer of Mary called the Magnificat. And if there's any person in this period of Jewish history that typifies the coming Christ, it is Samuel. For when he is born, his mother, out of such profound gratitude for God's answering her prayer, dedicates Samuel to the life of serving God and presents him to the then judge of Israel, the venerable Eli. And Samuel now stays under the care of Eli. And we remember that story, how in the middle of the night when uh, Samuel was sleeping, he heard a voice calling his name saying, Samuel. And he awoke and he ran over and he, he shook uh, his mentor, Eli, and he said, did you call me? And Eli said, no, you must be, you know, hearing things, go back to bed. And Samuel goes back to sleep and again God calls him in the darkness, calling him Samuel. Samuel rises again and runs to Eli and said, did you call me? And he said, no. And now Eli is beginning to get the idea that maybe it is God who is speaking to Samuel. And he gives instructions to Samuel. And so Samuel returns and goes back to sleep again. And now the third time God comes and speaks to him in the intimate form of address, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answers God saying, speak, Lord for thy servant hears. And then God reveals to Samuel that his judgment is going to come upon the house of Eli. For though Eli himself had judged Israel in the spirit of, of godliness, his sons were evil and Eli had failed to discipline them. And so Samuel says that he's going to bring his judgment upon the family of God says to Samuel, he's going to bring the judgment on the family of Eli. And in the morning, Eli said to Samuel, did God speak to you? And he said, yes. And he said, what did he say? And Samuel didn't want to tell him. And he was terrified to tell Eli the bad news. And Eli tries to wring it out of him, and Samuel won't give it to him until finally Eli says, well, whatever God said to you, Whatever he said, may it happen to you unless you tell me. And so Samuel said, okay, I'll tell you. And he told Eli that God was going to judge him and his household. And one of the things that is so significant about that moment was that when Eli heard the prophecy of his own doom and of God's judgment on his own family, he looked at Samuel and he said, it is the Lord. And soon after that, the judgment came. It came with the ignominious defeat of the Israelite soldiers in which Eli's sons were killed. And when Eli got the report of this, he fell over dead. But the darkest moment of Israel up to this point took place in this context because in that battle, the Ark of the Covenant, the throne of God Himself, was captured by the Philistines and taken away and set up as a trophy in the temple of Dagon, the Philistine God. And of course, the surviving daughter-in-law of, of Eli gave birth that day to a child. And she herself died as a result of her, 
uh, giving birth in this travail, but before she died, she named her son Ichabod, or Ichavod, which means the glory has departed, because the throne of Yahweh, the sacred ark, had been captured and placed in the hands of their most bitter enemies, the Philistines. The glory had departed from Israel. And it's in that context that Samuel emerges as the spiritual leader of the nation. He has to step into the uh, empty shoes of Eli at a time when the national faith and the national hope had reached an all-time low. But of course, we know the remarkable events that transpired thereafter, how that when the Philistines brought the throne of God into their temple to mock it and, and to use it as a trophy, what happened was the people themselves were afflicted by plagues, and their statue of their god was smashed into a thousand peoples pieces, and the, uh, the five kings of the Philistines began to play musical arcs, shipping it from one city-state to another, from Gath and Ascalon and so on. And everywhere the ark went, the plague went, until finally they got the message, it's not a good idea for us to keep the ark of Jehovah in captivity, and they sent it back by an ox cart in another remarkable story that I don't have time to go into now. But in that event, when the ox, ox carts or the cattle were, were carrying this, uh, this ark in this cart, no one was driving the ox cart. It was being led simply by the Spirit of God, and it came across the border back into Israel precisely to the place where God had ordained that it should come. And when the people of Israel saw the ark coming in a distance, they were rejoicing. And I don't know what they said, but I suggested that they said, Kavod, the glory is back. And during the life of Samuel, there is great blessing upon the nation, as had been during the terms of other judges. But at the end of his life, or near the end of his life, again Israel's hearts became hardened, and they did what was wicked in the sight of the Lord. But this time, their forsaking God took on an entire new dimension, one that was unprecedented in Old Testament history, and we read it in chapter 8 of 1 Samuel. We read, now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second Abijah, and they were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain. They took bribes. They perverted justice. And we're seeing now the repetition of the same thing that happened with the sons of Eli. You know, it's been said kind of as an axiom that God has no grandchildren. That just because somebody is a godly person and they have children, that does not automatically guarantee that the children will follow in the footsteps of the parents, because every generation needs conversion. And as soon as we think that we can bottle it and sell it and control and manipulate the gifts of God's Spirit, we've missed the whole reality of redemption. So all the elders of Israel gathered and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your way. Now make us a king to judge us like the nations. Now we've seen throughout the period of the judges that what gets Israel in trouble over and over and over again is their relentless pursuit of conformity to the pagan nations and pagan culture around them. First, it was an embracing of paganite religion. 
And now they want the political institutions that they observe around them to be imported and that they may be like everybody else. And all the other nations were ruled over by kings. Israel didn't have a king. That is, they didn't have an earthly king. They had forgotten who their king was because this was to be not a democracy or an oligarchy or an aristocracy or a monarchy. This was to be a theocracy where God was the king of His people. But now the people say, we want a king just like everybody else around us. Now, when Samuel hears this, he is very displeased. It says, the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And so Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Now let me just pause here. Samuel understood that. He knew that this wasn't just a rejection of him or of his family. That it was a rejection of everything he stood for. It was a rejection of everything he worked for. It was a rejection of his entire ministry. I don't know how many times I've talked to retired clergy, pastors, who devoted their lives to the nurture of the saints in a church, only to have that pastor retire and then watch the church fall apart and become secularized. And how heart-wrenching that is to any godly pastor or any godly minister. Now, obviously, Samuel was feeling this for himself, but he also understood that what was going on here was a rejection of the God that he represented to the people. And I wonder if he was surprised when he said, when God said to him, Samuel, listen to them. They've rejected me, so let them have their king. In this sense, God is like the prodigal father in the New Testament, who when his son wants to rebel and to go into a pagan land and to waste the riches of his own father's inheritance, which is what we all do. One of the things that I think is heroic about the prodigal father in that parable is that he lets him go. He doesn't stop caring about the son. He doesn't stop praying about the son. He doesn't stop loving the son, but he lets him go. He gives his son over to his own sinful inclinations, and this is how God deals with Israel. In fact, the final judgment of God is let him who is wicked be wicked still. The worst kind of judgment that God can, be, can send upon anybody is to give us free reign, to turn us over to our own evil inclinations. But here he's saying to Samuel, if the people don't want me to be their king, give them a king. That's the sinful foundation for the monarchy. And yet even in this, where the giving and the granting of the desire for a king in a very real sense is an act of divine judgment, yet in God's secret counsel as it becomes manifest later, God is going to work through this institution of the monarchy to provide His chosen king for His kingdom, who will be from the tribe of Judah, and whose kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, who will be the king of the kings and in the Lord of the lords. And so, even though the monarchy of Israel begins in a shameful set of circumstances. The monarchy, in a sense, foreshadows the coming kingdom of God. Let's just take one moment again to look at that word monarch. When we started the, our study, we looked at the very first verse of Genesis, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In the Greek translation of that, 
The word for beginning in Genesis 1 is the same word that it is in the chap first chapter of John's Gospel. N-R-K. In the beginning. Now that Greek word, R-K, means beginning, chief, or ruler. And the word R-K, as it's interpreted to mean chief, the preeminent one, comes into our own language. We talk about enemies and arch enemies, rivals and arch rivals, bishops and archbishops, and angels and archangels, uh, heretics and heresiarchs, or arch heretics. That means they are the chief, the big ones. The idea of the word monarchy means one chief, one ruler, one sovereign. And the reason that this is such a, a dramatic moment in Jewish his, history is that up until this point, there was only one ruler for Israel, and it was God. And so God sees in this desire for an earthly monarch an attempt to supplant His reign. They have rejected me that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so are they doing to you also. Now heed their voice. However, he said, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them, because the beginning of the monarchy is the beginning of the radical corruption of the Jewish nation. So Samuel told the words of the Lord to the people who asked for a king, and he said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots to be his horsemen. And some will run before his chariots. That is, he's going to set up a draft board, and he's going to conscript your sons and use them for the advancing of his conquests. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. He will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest and some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. Now you're going to begin to work for the state instead of for yourself. <laughs> instead of being able to, to eat what you produce, you're going to have to use uh, uh, the labor of your uh, farming to feed the government. So that's what's going to happen. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. And he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, your olive groves, and give them to his servants. He will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men, your donkeys, and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep, and you will be his servants. And you will cry out on that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, we will have a king over us, that we may be like all the nations, and that the king may judge us and go out before us to fight our battle. And so after this solemn warning, God instructed that an emerging hero among the people, a man with great gifts of military might, a man of enormous stature and handsome and proud, from the tribe of Benjamin, which should have been a hint already because going back to the patriarchal blessing of Genesis, it was to the tribe of Judah that the kingdom of God was promised. The scepter shall not depart from Shiloh until Judah comes. I'm sorry, the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. But this man, who is the first king of Israel, is not from the tribe of Judah. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. Interestingly enough, because later on, centuries passed, another Benjaminite by the same name becomes very important in redemptive history. For both of these men, 
were named Saul. King Saul and Saul of Tarsus. The first Saul ends in disgrace. The second Saul becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. But Saul is anointed by Samuel as the first king of Israel. And his reign begins with glory. He, he, he has tremendous military victories, and he becomes enormously popular with the people. But there was a fatal flaw in the man. There was a kind of arrogance that befell Saul. On one occasion, he was waiting for Samuel, who was to come and, and bless him before they went into battle and to offer the sacrifices to God to prepare the armies for that occasion. And Samuel didn't show up exactly on time, and so Saul was impatient. And so he took it upon himself to make the sacrifices. Yes, there was a separation of church and state to the sense that there was a division of labor here, and it was not the responsibility of the king to arrogate for himself, the rights and the privileges and the authorities of the judge. But Saul took his filthy hands and desecrated the holy things. And at that moment, Samuel arrived and he saw it. And he said, for this, Saul, God has rejected you. <clears throat> and he has reserved for himself a man after his own heart whom he will raise up to replace you and your house. And Saul goes crazy. He shrinks from his responsibility as the commander of chief when he's confronted by the champion of the Philistines with the giant Goliath. And he stands aside while a young boy comes up and delivers the nation from the oppression of the Philistines. And the people begin to sing in a very short time, Saul has slain his thousands, David has slain his tens of thousands, and Saul is enraged and filled with jealousy, and to the end of his life pursues David, whom by now Samuel has anointed to be the king. Uh, inauspicious, inauspicious beginning for such a remarkable monarch. Any comments? I was reading that more um, while I first knew a devotion I've got to her this year. She heard about Saul several days and talking about him. And she says that, that this pride and arrogance is so often related to a low self image. And, low, and remember how he first said, Me, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, I'm nothing, you know, when he was approached uh, to begin with about being king or whatever and so those two kind of go together and I, I thought that was interesting um, and another thing is the the ark of the covenant when it said it, the glory's left us what what was inside the ark is the word of god mm -hmm. and i feel like in you know i never saw that as judgment but that's kind of what's happened to us the, the word of god has left us this country left our government our schools anything related to the government this is now you're you're considered a hater even if you <laughs> if you if you speak God's word at all, you're considered a hater, and yet it's the it's the very Christians that get the death threats from those around, you know, so it's actually the opposite. But um that that whole thing about the ark and being a judgment, I never thought about that. That was good, and that's exactly what's happening here. Yeah. You know, speaking of New York, I never thought about it. He said uh, it, the spirit of God drove that ark. Nobody drove that ark on that ark. I never thought about that. But what really, I think it's not funny, but these, these kings, they played music for chairs in that ark. Like he said, hey, Dennis, would you like this thing? And they wouldn't even touch it. It was, it was going around. But uh, yeah, I never, never thought about that. Because you know, the, the, uh, these people picked it up, they touched it, nothing happened to them. So I figured. Yeah. They, Except that they. Got, yeah, they got all yeah, messed up. All they got it really messed up. Yeah. 
They're but saying that those cows that, that pulled it, uh, Beth Morris was about that too. She's saying those cows, they chose certain animals that would naturally turn back with it. And uh, and they, those cows probably had nursing babes, you know, so that they would naturally turn back to go, but they didn't. They were led by God. So we can tell Tesla as people, uh, you know, the first guy who had a car <laughs> that drives itself. So, yeah. That's hilarious. I think all this, uh, we can't see it from our perspective, but I think all this is going on today, too. It is. That we just we just well, don't have the capability of seeing it. Well, I think that what, what you said, we're seeing manifestations of the loss of the word to the people. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm not going to say that the United States is... The country itself is suffering because of that. The country itself is suffering because of the individuals within it that have given up the faith and given up uh, being true to God's word. Um, when I found something interesting that R.C. said, and I'm going to write it down so we can see it. Um, four words, really interesting, just four words. Every generation. Oh, yeah. Needs what? Yeah. Well, I mean, we're kind of yeah. What's the word? That he used conversion. conversion. Yeah. Now, we are on a journey um, here at the church through our uh, uh, Fanning the Flame program of looking at youth ministry. And one of the big questions that is out there in all of youth ministry is why, why are we losing our, our, our kids to the church? You know, if we're uh, uh, coming to the church, um, and let in on a secret. I started in youth ministry 50 years ago, and that was the same thing that was being said 50 years ago. Kids are leaving the church. Now, why, why, Margie, why are you in the church? Well, I, that would take a while to say, but it's been very quick. Just in a nutshell, obedience. Obedience because of what? What happened to you? You were what? Converted. You were converted. And I see all these articles on youth ministry out there and why, what we need to do to get kids back. I saw one article that really said, and it had to do with conversion. And it says the reason we're losing our children uh, in the church is because we're not uh, evangelizing them, we're not discipling them, and we're not modeling them. If we did those three things, we wouldn't be losing the kids. Right. Yeah, well, that's all part that's all part of the discipleship and so forth. Discipline too. Discipleship. Discipleship. I mean, that's true. That um, that yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I just found that that was very interesting in in in, in this context. If we're not converted, I wonder where do you think Eli's children were even converted? I think it was too easy to give the father. Maybe. Well, but do you think they were converted? No, because no. what they did. No, so a lot of times that happens to kids of you know uh, preachers' kids, PKs. You know, yeah. they're, they're already there. They kind of said that. Others and grandchildren. Yeah, right, right. right. Yeah. There, there's my kids don't come to Christ because they're my kids. Yeah. They come to Christ because they're elect. Right. That's why they come. So to we, Christ. Don't, we don't neglect what we no, do. No, we do, we do what do. we're supposed to do. Yeah, exactly. But it's just like uh, the lady that you were talking about that you yeah. want to you want to talk to. Yeah. You are not going to convince her. Right. You're going to give her information. Right. That. The Holy Spirit we use to right. convince her. And in parts of the world, um, you know, that's meaning urgent physical need first and then spiritual need. But with her, it's just showing her, okay, I lost a father to suicide. Okay, so now I can relate to this and yep. to show her that love, to meet her at a commonality, you know, and then and then to to really pour out love to her, and then hopefully she will sense that spirit. Anyway, so but what you said about the uh, the at the very beginning about the people saying you don't have to go to 
church. Yeah. That's all signs and symptoms of not being in God's word. I think because when you're there, that's that's the source of truth, the source of light, and that brings about conviction, you know. And so you're it's all it really all comes back to the word. Yeah. Yeah, we're not thinking we're glad uh assembling ourselves together. Right. That's right. Right. So so there's gonna be some conversations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my grandfather, who would be way over 100 now, he always said the best government is the monarchy if it's a good one. Well, and that's, and, and obviously, um, the theocracy as monarchy is what is going to be the good one, the theocracy. Um, just a monarchy or, you know, whatever um, is not is not a good answer because it's still driven by man. Um, now, some men have taken that to mean that, um, and, and they're called theonomists. Have you, have you heard that term, theonomists? And they want to see government set up so that everything, you know, I mean, you would, you would stone people for adultery. You know, you would, um, there, there's not as much, I don't think there's as much mercy in theonomy as there as as, as uh, there is in a the theocracy. But they're taking you back to the Jewish law, right? And uh, Jesus Himself said not to stone the woman or the one that said right. cast the first stone. Uh, yeah, uh, and we are getting so big. We're getting so worldwide. Israel was just a little, yeah. Right. But we are so, and everything that impacts. This part of the continent over here in Africa or whatever impacts us. I mean, we were so interconnected. Yeah. yeah. I have an in, thing of that. I have an interesting, just a little uh, rabbit trail. I have an interesting take on how we could solve the immigration issue. We should just go take all those countries and make them all citizens. There you go. <laughs> now, I, I yeah. don't know a lot of harm in the board. I've really yeah. you know, get down to Mexico and, yeah. and, and annex Mexico in the United States and go to Honduras, annex yes, part of the Honduras in the United States and, and Cuba and all these places. And that would solve the immigration problem because they'd all be citizens. Well, see, what a great mission field. I mean, you see all the, the, the clips of them crossing over. I'm like, where are the missionaries? Where are the people yeah. out there with the, you know, say, you know, to, to present the gospel to them? They're still illegal, and nobody wants to. to no, they don't. They yeah. don't want to recognize that. And I, I maybe I'm vicious, but I think we need to learn the border. I had an argument with a Guatemala. I don't know whether it's legal or illegal. He said, "Well, you don't shoot people." I'm saying, "You? Yeah. I'm not saying you shoot people. They cross a the line. They've given they've given you license to shoot them." Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I thought I was chuckling about one, one of our elders up in uh, up in Pennsylvania when when he started all these hijacking. You know, he's I know how to stop all that, and, and he's everybody gets on a, on a plane bare naked, and like when you get on it, uh, you know, go on a roller coaster, and strap comes down, and you sit like yes, yeah. <laughs> he's well, okay. <laughs> That's good. Make everybody a citizen. That, that, that'd be good. No, no, but you, you have to keep your country together. Uh, my goodness, when my grandfather came over to Ellis Island, he had to prove that he could speak English, read English, and understand English. He spoke with a Swedish accent, but I'm telling you, that man was intelligent. Mm -hmm. and he tried to he tried to teach me uh, with the Swedish Bible. And who wants to learn Swedish? <laughs> and I wish I would have. I wish I would have taken the time. Um, I think that was that fascinating in this study how quickly, even though they were warned, how quickly the, the Jews wanted to go back into slavery, mm -hmm. which is really where they went. They went back into slavery. They talked about they were going to be servants. No, they were going to be slaves. To whoever was in charge. So Saul was in charge. They were slaves to Saul. But how quickly, after seeing all the visions from God, all the you know, all the things that he did for them, everything that he gave them, how quickly they 
He would want to go back to yeah. being he was a slave. No, yeah, and when they when they came out of Egypt, they were hardly uh, you know across the border, and they're saying, "Whoa, whoa, you know, we need to we need to go back." It was so much better. Well, we have I don't think yeah. they're going to say that coming from America, but. But Hebrews talks about that. You know, we can, you know, we want to go back to being a slave to our sin. And it talks about that. Like you've been, it, it was a strong warning in Hebrews chapter 10 about, you know, you've been touched by spirit, filled with spirit. You've walked, you've been baptized, and then you go back. There's very, very stern warnings. Yes. The stern warning from God himself to the people of Israel. You know, warn them sternly and that they should, you know, listen and obey you. And here he told them everything that was going to happen to them, and it did. Uh, slavery is really not, unless you're a slave to Christ, but not a slave to uh, him. That's the oxymoron. To slave to Christ is freedom. Right. Mm -hmm. Slavery is not what you know, they were looking for. They, they, they don't know what they're looking for. Well, you're in sync with the whole natural order as a slave mm -hmm. in Christ. Otherwise, you're opposed to it. But mm -hmm. just think. Just think within the last what 20 years how uh, we have become enslaved to our government. Oh, but Dan said it I mean, people are you know, more enslaved from that government, they're enslaved to credit cards, they're enslaved to yeah. debt, they're enslaved to and around their products, their functions, their food, everything. There's, 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 there's a great passage in Second Peter 2 19. And um, if you remember. I don't know how many of you remember what was called the Good News Bible. Yeah. Good News Bible. It was a New Testament. And it was one of the first ones that was in a modern. Uh, I think mine was new and old. I thought mom and dad gave it to me. Pardon? I thought that mine was a new and an old testament. Well, they did come out with one, oh. with both of them. But originally, oh. and this is 55, 56 years oh. ago. All right. Uh, but they did come out with one. But but the way it reads in there is a man is a slave to anything that has defeated him. So mm -hmm. that's what that's what it is. Sin defeats us. Mm -hmm. Sin defeats us. And we become a slave to that. And um, that's what was going on here. You know, these people were a slave to being a slave. You know, they really wanted... They, they wanted the easy way out. They didn't want to, gee whiz, they didn't want to have to work beyond what they had to do. They didn't know what they were missing. Yeah, you know, they, didn't, they didn't want to advance. They didn't, you know, really. Yeah. So uh, so they were they were going to become slaves. You said it when you said those who are elect. You said it at some point today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's truly those who are elect are going to be the fruit bearers. Not that we're not going to follow, the Bible says we right. will, but you know, that truly, those, those are going to be the fruit bearers who stay on the path and continue to grow those who are truly elect. Yep. And, that, and that in and of itself is the power of God. Yes. Oh, totally. Yeah. All God. I, they, 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 uh, we're to be information givers. That's right. Okay. Um, I worked for Child Evangelism Fellowship for a year. And we did a thing where we took kids off for training. They were very Armenian. They were brethren, and they were Armenian to the core. I was very uncomfortable with them because, um, you know, here I am a ruling elder in, in the denomination that says you have to subscribe to the Westminster Confession of Faith. They didn't even know what it was. <laughs> and uh, But we went to this training, and there was a girl there that was a college girl. We were training them to doing do the backyard Bible clubs in the summers. And so one of the tasks was that we had to do was take the kids out and have them find some kids in the neighborhood and share the gospel with them. And this one girl, she started talking about how she found this little girl. And she said, I just was talking to her and talking to her and I couldn't convince her that she was bad. She can't, I would say, do you, and, and she said, no, I'm, a, I'm good. And the girl started crying, and and she was just so. And, I, and at that point, I realized, you know, we have to understand that it's not us. It's not us. It's a, it's it's us giving the information, 
We need to let that let people know that they're sinners. No, but we're not going to convince them that sin's bad. It's true, and the, uh, the um, you know, the pregnancy center. It's not my responsibility to change that woman's life. That's her mind, whether she can abort or keep her child. My responsibility is to give her the gospel as clearly and as concisely as I can to get to convince her that what she's committing is murder. But it's not my responsibility. That is such a load off people's. Who, who work in that mm -hmm. field, that we're not responsible for her decision. We're only responsible to give her exactly what it is that, we, that we've created. You know, we give her this whole thing, all of this information that you're talking about, but I'm not responsible if she goes down tomorrow and, and aborts that child. Right. And that's such a big burden that you lift off people because you're not responsible for that same evangelism. You give them the word, you give them the information, then it's the Holy Spirit that takes over. You're just the vessel to bring forth the information, but the Holy Spirit, Spirit it's not your hand. And, and, and yeah. this, is, this is something that has sort of bothered me about uh, how many in the pro-life movement want to call uh, pro-choice people or pro-abortion people, murderers. Yeah, you don't want to walk a fine Yeah, that's for, you know, you can bring them to conviction, but you can't bring them to If you tell me I'm a murderer, and you and that's how you lead. You're going to burn the building down. Well, yeah. And, but it's, Seriously, you're going to run the stuff. And, and, uh, and then, and I, but, I, but I'm just trying to talk to that person. I'm not getting into all the other stuff. I'm just trying to deal with that one person. And if I tell them that they're, they're a murderer, if, if somebody told me I was a murderer, how, how long would that take for, for me to keep in that conversation? Yeah. You can't, and you can't tell a woman who's like from me, sitting in front of me, listen, you're going to commit murder. Yeah. yeah. If you go down to the abortion clinic, yeah. they really can't go that direction. Yeah. I have to give her the love of Christ that's, then it's the Holy Spirit to come in and, you know, well, she may have had an abortion that thing or she may not have. Yeah. I'm not allowed to do that. Yeah. And, and I don't feel it's to do that. Right. Some people do. Some people yeah. are very extreme about it, you know, but, okay, what you want to do is bring her to conviction. You don't want to bring her in condemnation, which is what you're doing. Right. When you're trying to see the murderer, then it's like, well, wait, that's the you are too. You yeah. didn't you just call that guy on the street a fool? Yeah. yeah. You're on the same level yeah. as, as her. So be careful what you say. Right. And a lot of times on that, on that particular subject, once they see the old child, see it's a baby, that's really most, a lot of the time, that's all it takes. You see, yeah, the, all it really takes a lot of times, it's a very unusual for a woman who sees a sonogram mm -hmm. to say, oh, no, that's not a child. Yeah, that's very, that's really rare. Um, it's like 95% of them will say, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Yeah. So, so we have we have a need as God's chosen to keep from becoming enslaved. Okay. okay. We are to be a slave. Who who's who who's to be our slaveholder? Christ. Okay. On the abortion issue, I don't think if you step back. I don't think all the push for pro-life pro and all the push for pro-abortion for loss. I think as long as they don't say the doctor must or the woman must have an abortion, how are you, what are you going to do with a woman that gets an abortion in 15 weeks or three days? How, how are you going to, I mean, it's just complicating things. Uh, you, you get to the individual woman. Yes. Yeah, and, and that's what it's going to come down to. And that's what it's going to come down to is the individual. If you got to that person that had that abortion at fifteen weeks and three days, you got to her before that. Mm -hmm. See that that that's that's uh, that's one of the things when when I think about school shootings, for example. If somebody had shared the gospel with that person, you know, now maybe maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but. If the gospel had been shared with that person and that person was converted, they would have never done it. Yeah, but most of those, those 
shooters, first of all, most of them are male. And they come from broken homes. But the gospel, no matter who shares it with you, whether it's your parents or it's somebody from the outside, if you're converted, you're going to change. But yeah, but I don't I don't want to blame. I don't want to, that's not the that's not the point that I'm trying to make that they came from a broken home. They came from a point that maybe the gospel had never been shared with them. It could be. No, it probably wasn't. And it wasn't effective when it was. Mm -hmm. But but if we want to put a stop to these things, we've got to become aggressive with the gospel. Mm -hmm. And even kids that you know you hear them interviewed all the time, I saw signs that just insane. That's just signs that they have problems. Yeah. And people all around them feel guilty because I saw this, I saw that. If I should have said something, they threatened this, but I just thought they were kidding. When, you know. When I worked at Stonewall Jacks, which was kids that were murderers, they were rapists, they were violent offenders, they you name it, they had done it. There were kids in there that were gang members that had the little tear. Do you know what the tear means? Do you know what the tear when they have a tear on that's it? It means they killed somebody. Hmm. Okay. We had kids in there that had tears. Now I never once went and thought about this kid came from a broken home when I was working with him. Now I saw that and I saw some some manifestations of that, but that wasn't my intent. My intent was, and see, I, I was the assistant chaplain, so I could share the gospel. I could share the gospel. But the, the and and it's like um when I took a kid to the eye doctor, first time I took a kid to the eye doctor at Cabarrus Eye Center, uh, uh, doc, uh, the eye doctor that I took him into, uh, Dr. Thomas, kid's in the chair, Dr. Thomas started sharing the gospel with him. Wow. Now here's, a, this is, and nobody could say anything to Dr. Thomas, you know, he started sharing the gospel with him. Uh, you know, there's a reason why that guy became my eye doctor, because he was a believer, you know. So, um, okay, uh, is there a comparison between Hannah's song and Mary's Magnificat? Scroll says Mary. Well, I guess we're not going to get to that. Okay. Well. Um, <laughs> through these things. And uh, next week, we're going to look at data. Okay, next week, we're going to look at data. All right. Is, is Marilyn okay? She can she's, she's uh, got... Uh, working with the kitchen? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, I was like, yeah, she's got the kitchen today. So we heard Father Abraham. You did. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got we get my room. We'll just fly from down the road, down the road. Down the <laughs> they, they, you can't tell if they're going to be like really, or they're going to be like. Mm -hmm. yeah. there, there's there's one doing a little bit of crying today. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Well, um, just a little thing. We had we had a good uh, men's meeting the other night. Uh, about thirty guys were there. Bill didn't go because of the tornado. Yeah, it was nothing. I drove. I just the rain. Just on the television, right? Tornado's imminent. We're like, what? Yeah. Did you get that from? And anyway, which was. Yeah. I looked at the radio. I looked at the I looked. Boring. I looked. Yeah. Well, it was it was raining badly, but uh, it, when he felt bad, but he was. Yeah. I picked up Chuck. I, I picked him up. Chuck got in the car and I looked at the radar, and the way that I come up, there's nothing. Oh, good. It just rained, and it, it was where we were. And going down, uh, and you know, it was a couple of miles from here. But it rained, and when I was coming down uh, from '73 down to the roundabout there in Concord, man, it was that's where it was the worst rain. And it was, and the lightning, the flashing, yeah. 
20. Yeah. It's like where their heads heading for thunderstorm were like. <laughs> yeah, it was it, that tornado was across the river. It was a gas. Yeah, right. There was a tornado in gas. Yeah. yeah. It was it was on the ground for about six miles, I'd say. So anyway, well, and and um, one of the churches, it was a, a Reformed Presbyterian Church in North America in Selma, Alabama. And I believe it was, it, it, it was multicultural. And, and uh, um, but that's, again, the song singers, you know, um, their church was destroyed. Yeah. Their church was completely destroyed. Selma, Alabama, totally got it. Yes. Selma, yeah. Yeah. They, they and uh, none of their none of the parishioners were uh, were hurt. Most of their properties were intact, but uh, the, the uh, manse and the uh, the manse was damaged. But the, I mean, I saw pictures of church. It's just nothing. It's just nothing. So. Well, what would you be able to see? Well, I'd love God's, to see. God's plan. One. Oh. Mm -hmm. The one. I mean, there's so many blind. One street and then the other one was fine. Mm -hmm. One street and yeah. the other one was fine. So what, like, what was it? Uh, yeah. All right. Well, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thanks for this day. Pray for our brother Bill. We ask you to be with him and uh, uh, help him get back to full strength. And these colds and things can really be a, a pain in the head, the chest, and uh, everywhere else. And we just ask for Lord, that uh, you relieve him of that. We thank you, Lord, for uh, your scriptures. We thank you that we can see application today from what was going on back then. We pray, Lord, that we would not be like um, the Israelites and want to go back to what it was. But Lord, help us to always be looking to go forward, to move forward in our lives, and to be to be more sanctified each and every day um, so that we can come closer to you. Lord, we're thankful again for uh, being able to come to worship you today. And we pray that you'll be with Steve as he brings the message. And uh, we pray that you'll be with uh, Jim Bigler in uh, every aspect of our worship service. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. 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 Hopefully, Wednesday, I will move those up again. <laughs> Because I, I come in and I, I do the work, and I am one ahead. So the Wednesday I'll come in and do the next one after, uh, you know, like for two weeks. Yeah, uh, camera. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could keep this camera on here. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs>